This video has been supported by JLC PCB. Hey folks, a few months ago I bought a high-speed thermal imaging camera. One can kind of tell by the aerodynamic design and the Ferrari color. This thing can't count ppm's, so I don't really know why I got it, but I'm sure we can squeeze some fun out of it now that it's here. It's an InfraTech Image IR 3300 MCT. Originally, this series of cameras was developed by French company Cedip and called Jade. Cedip has been acquired by Fleur in 2009, so I don't know why this product is now carried by a German thermal imaging brand. Oh well, shouldn't really matter to me, right? The only info I was able to find about this thing is a Chinese datasheet, and that sure sounds promising. The 320 by 240 full frame resolution is about what you get from a mid-range consumer camera these days. And that's about it in terms of similarities. At full resolution we can get gamer worthy 170 FPS, and by reading smaller and smaller portions of the sensor we can get up to 9000 FPS. Wow, maybe that's why Fleur didn't want to touch these. They are still stuck under US regulations, making exporting everything above 9 FPS a bureaucratic challenge. The MCT in the name stands for Mercury Cadmium Telluride, a narrow gap semiconductor material that detects photons of its favorite wavelength directly. The precise composition of the detector material determines the bandwidth of radiation that can excite electrons within and is therefore detectable. In our case, a thin slice of mid-infrared, 3.7 to 5 micrometer. The direct detection of photons, as opposed to waiting for actual matter in microbolometers or thermopile arrays to get warmed by infrared radiation, is what makes this technology immensely sensitive and fast if necessary. There is one little downside though, these detectors need cryogenic cooling lest they get excited by just ambient temperatures. That could be done with a built-in dewer for holding liquid nitrogen or other refreshing beverages. With a stack of Peltier coolers if you have the energy to spare, or like in our case with a miniature Sterling cryo cooler. I think we've got a high quality Ricoh rotary type cooler in here. But I'm not sure exactly how it is driven. The first board we are greeted with has a sizable FPGA. Right next to some TO220 power transistors and shunt resistors. Two pairs connected to another board with a lot of passive filtering components. So I don't know, is it some kind of weird two-phase motor? Oh no, look we've got another actuator for a filter wheel. So I guess we are just driving two self-commutating DC motors. Oh, it's like a little race car engine. Cute. Wanna play a game? How much do you think this cryo cooler costs new? Leave a comment, I'll tell you in a few days after the video release. It lives up to its name, that's all I'm going to say for now. The lens is a massively important part of the system, and just like the HP 3458A cooling fan, I wouldn't recommend tampering with it. But again, I just couldn't help myself. It looks like somebody was in here before and dutifully spread some of that thread grease on the lens itself. I don't think it'll make a visible difference on any image taken with this camera, but I would like it gone anyway. First, this thing, made from, uh, let's just say a blood pressure cuff and some heat shrink tubing, can be used to blow away some dust particles that I don't want to smear around underneath a tissue later. For tissues I'm using these Thorlabs ones, and if that isn't enough, I'm double gloved and ready to use this new deliciously dangerous substance that should evaporate without leaving a trace. A dry tissue alone didn't do it of course, but dip, wipe and wipe again with the dry side left a great result. Could be better, but I don't want to wipe too much and endanger any kind of magic coating that may or may not be on there. The 10 watts needed for the Sterling cooler to generate roughly 1 watt of actual cooling power are mostly radiated away from the sensor with this die cast aluminium enclosure. The sensor itself lives in a laser welded stainless steel vacuum jacket, which eliminates heat transfer by convection. The whole assembly seems to be made by yet another thermal imaging company, who are marketing it mainly towards defense applications. I love how they are specifying noise as just 1000 electrons. What, per time? Per pixel? Per sensor? Oh, and it's apparently possible to get a lot more full frame FPS out of it. In our application we might be throttled by readout electronics or just by integration time. 
The actual readout electronics are probably just this one bottom board with four 14 bit 10 mega sample per second ADCs. But in the back seat there is a lot more high performance digital stuff going on. Presumably digital signal processing for pixel wise calibration, correction and manipulation in real time. The computer that belongs at the receiving end of that 68 pin RS422 cable won't have a lot of time for such overhead while having to store all the incoming high speed data. Alright, let's see something then. Along with a camera I got a 24 volt switching power supply with a built in fan that comes on when it's running for a while. There are no power switches anywhere, so I guess I'm just plugging in the Lemo power connector to turn on the camera. I also got this RS-232 control cable, D sub 9 to Lemo 3 pin. I don't have software, documentation or anything for this interface, so I don't think it'll be terribly useful right off the bat. This 5 meter cable is for the real, serious, massively parallel data output port. It looks just like a SCSI cable and sure enough it uses the same 68 pin high density sub D connector. The camera and the frame grabber PCI card are both labeled RS422. A standardized differential communication that many will be familiar with. Only in this case with 20 or so differential pairs working simultaneously. Again, I didn't get any software or documentation for the hardware. There isn't even a manufacturer or a product name on the frame grabber card. So I think for a first test I'm going to try something a little bit more primitive. I hope the composite video output doesn't need a secret RS-232 command to enable. Oh, we've got a test image at least. And that remains until the cryo cooler reaches its target temperature of 70 Kelvin, I think. Oh hi, who's this handsome devil? Ooh, listen. The cryo cooler slows down as it reaches its set point. Yeah, wow, that is one very nice thermal image for sure. Too bad it's tainted with my ugly mug. Here's proof that it is indeed only IR and not mixed with a normal image sensor. A strategy that cheaper consumer cameras often use to make their footage look better. Visually transparent acrylic is absorbing IR completely, which is why it is so vulnerable to CO2 lasers. A visually opaque plastic bag on the other hand can be completely transparent to infrared. Which uh, you could witness too if genius me wasn't holding it directly in front of the screen. Oops, I'll repeat that in a minute. I can see myself breathe by looking at my nostrils which is pretty funny. But I think a few hundred FPS would amuse me even more right now. Now there was a bit of a struggle. I asked the manufacturer for software and documentation for the stuff, but naturally they refused because everything had been obsolete for years. But then some unexpected, no absolutely miraculous help arrived from the creator of the Otter Iron Pro, remember? Who had obtained exactly the same camera at exactly the same time inside of a working setup. After experimenting around for a while I found out that the unlabeled frame grabber card is actually Infratech's own development called FG9800. Unfortunately I didn't get that to work at all. So I had to organize a different frame grabber, a Bitflow Roadrunner R12. For that to work I had to fabricate an adapter from 68 pin high density to 62 pin D sub without knowing the camera pinout that was 100% tedious and 0% entertaining. Same goes for the software. The new frame grabber at least has manuals, a sophisticated SDK and lots of demo programs available. But given how niche the application and how many counts of first degree software piracy I'd have to admit, I think it would be best if we just skipped ahead to the magic moment. Oh yeah, there we go. Hmm, looks like we've got some dead or at least offset pixels, which is not that unusual for such a specialty low production volume sensor. 
Maybe I can return to my comfort zone and calibrate those away later. Now the sensitivity, the low noise, the dynamic range and the high thermal resolution are indeed amazing on this camera. But whatever does one use its high speed capabilities for? There are of course lots and lots of tactical applications that I can't demonstrate. Fleur has some of those on their website. Personally, no surprise, I'm more interested in technical ones, such as testing precision film and foil resistors for etching defects and hotspots. This NASA research from 2019 concluded that a frightening 10-25% to of all tested SMD foil resistors came with subtle construction defects. Those can be hard to detect visually, so they propose overloading the resistors with very short impulses of power while looking closely at the pattern with a high-speed thermal camera. Unfortunately, I can't focus on such small details with a default lens. And I can't substitute with a cheap glass lens either, because that would absorb most of my mid-infrared. This is a zinc selenide lens for focusing CO2 lasers. Looks a bit like candy, mid-infrared transparent candy. With careful positioning it magnifies things for sure, but still not quite enough to make the resistive foil pattern visible unfortunately. And I also didn't feel like sacrificing any more fancy foil resistors in an attempt to find one with larger features. Let's try and record a high speed sequence. I've set the parameters to full frame, 100 fps and the total record length to 1000 frames. Unfortunately it doesn't display in real time while recording, but I guess that could be done with the BNC video output on the camera itself. User experience was probably not a thing when this software was created. The live viewer can save image sequences as files, which then have to be opened in a different program. A double click is not enough though, you have to reopen them in a very specific way using 7 clicks before you can export a sequence as an AVI video file. And here's what we end up with. Again, this was only 100 FPS. Here is 700 for you, with half of the resolution. Let's see if we can get rid of some of those dead pixels. I think right now we are using a different camera's calibration file, which might explain some of them. Uncooled sensors require such an offset calibration much more often, which is why most modern modules in handheld and automotive cameras have a calibration shutter built right in. This one just asks for the lens cap to be applied for a few seconds and yeah, that had a tremendous effect. There still are a handful of problems around here, but I no longer see a literal galaxy of dead pixels superimposed on everything. How about some CNC chips? The optimal cut transfers all the heat into the chips and none of it into the workpiece or the tool. In reality, few things are optimal, so I suppose a high-speed thermal imaging camera can be very useful for fine-tuning process parameters. In aluminium, transitioning to Datron's 4-in-1 single flute end mills has already eliminated all thermal concerns for me. But for other materials, sure, that'd be an interesting application. Gases have IR properties too. CO2 and CO happen to be the only ones that absorb wavelengths within the detectable range of this camera. I can't quite produce enough of this stuff on my own, so I got a bottle of carbonated water to help. Cool. It's a bit hard to see, but in combination with specialized filters, infrared cameras can not only detect but also identify gases, making them interesting for environmental research and risk detection. Thank goodness it can't see methane or else I would have been tempted to demonstrate that too. Well, that's pretty much all I have for this overview. After a message from our sponsor, I'll show you why this camera is not going to become my daily driver for electronic troubleshooting and so forth. JLCPCB has some exciting news for us. Their unbelievable $2 pricing for 2 and 4 layer FR4 boards has been extended to include single layer boards on aluminium base material too. That is an absolute game changer in power and precision circuits. 
because you can sink 100 watt through the substrate without it warming up more than 0.1 degrees C. Laterally, the thermal conductivity is very useful as well, giving you the ability to eliminate thermal gradients and couple components closely. For example, to compensate MOSFET threshold voltage tempcos. This Apex power op amp was not made by JLC PCB, but it features a perfectly temperature compensated MOSFET output stage. Based on a proprietary blend of semiconductor tempcos in the bias chain, it wouldn't work if all the parts weren't thermally coupled by an aluminium PCB. Another bit of news, interesting especially to the Europeans. JLC PCB now has an outpost in Germany, where they can handle the import bureaucracy much more swiftly and much cheaper than your local customs office. This way, the new European VAT directive that nobody needed and nobody was prepared for hurts a lot less. Thanks for that and for sponsoring this video to JLC PCB. What I ordered are kind of just LTZ or ADR1000 dev boards with various footprints for all the configuration and buffering resistors. That deserves a video of its own. For now I just wanted to use it as a demo piece to show you a thermal camera that is much better suited as a daily driver. See Infratech produces outstanding image quality but it takes over 6 minutes to start. It needs a Windows XP PC with a PCI slot which pretty much rules out everything mobile. And it's just way too precious to be kicking around on cluttered work surfaces among my other day to day tools. So I got another affordable thermal imaging camera from Banggood. A Wintech WT3320. Which they stopped selling shortly afterwards so uh, I don't know. Anybody still interested in this? I think I'm still going to give it a once over because inside we are going to find a popular sensor module that can still be bought in many other cameras. A few generic accessories are included and a disappointingly reasonable user manual with hardly any chinglish to make fun of. Hey, where do I get permission if I want to weld my battery? The camera has the same 320 by 240 resolution as the Infratech one. But it is a lot more convenient with a few second startup time, a built-in display and some memory to store still images in. I haven't taken it apart yet, but just by looking at that characteristic lens with a circular hole pattern, I can tell that there's a Seek Mosaic core in there, made in the USA, so 9fps limited. There's also a visible light LED and a visible light camera. Not that useful for me, but okay. Just gotta make sure to disable the flashlight before secretly, creepily taking thermal images of people in public. We've got automatic gain control enabled all the time. Which means that in order to see small temperature differences, no large differences may be present in the shot. Because for example the color white always corresponds to the highest visible temperature and not to a specific value. That is my only complaint in regards to the software. The up down buttons have no functions outside of the menu. So wouldn't they be perfect for implementing manual ranging? Everything else is pretty much there. Alignment of the visible and the infrared image. Access to saved images, different color palettes and emissivity settings for different materials. No video recording is available and I don't think that's expected from any of these handheld cameras. The image quality with the built in LCD is not too impressive, but things get a little bit better when viewing snapshots on a PC. Which kinda makes you wonder, can't we bypass the LCD and read the image sensor directly somehow? Well, I cracked open the camera and extracted the Seek Mosaic thermal core. It's held in place by this rubbery bracket, presumably to dampen the vibrations from the calibration shutter. This little cube is actually a thermal camera in its own right. It connects to a host, like a computer, a smartphone or this all winner A33 system on chip via good old USB. I didn't want to ruin the camera by modifying its flat flex cable, so I botched a USB cable to some test points. And sure enough, my Windows machine approved. I only had to assign a generic driver with Zadig. Now EEV Block forum member Joe C has developed a fantastic thermal imaging and analysis software which can directly interface with a wide variety of sensors. A Seek thermal core being just one of them. It begins its strict regular shutter operation as soon as I click connect in the software. The many camera interfaces, 
the built-in processing and analysis tools and the presence of some form of positive user experience in this freeware make it so much better than the ancient tools we've used before. That may be an unfair comparison, but my request for a more modern demo version was ignored, so it's the only one I have. Hmm, I wonder if I can use this software with one of the InfraTech frame grabbers. Eh, maybe another day. I just wanted to show you that this exists and it's awesome. For now I'm going to put the camera back together to be computer independent again. Unfortunately it's not trivial to have the direct seek USB port exposed permanently as an option. I would need some kind of USB switch, which I also don't really feel like hacking in there right now. One thing I will hack though is the dust cover. I've modeled and 3D printed a replacement part with a hole in it for some IR transparent candy. This way I always have my macro lens ready to go and my dust protected. Like most of these cameras, this one came from the factory with a good general purpose focal length configured. It needs at least 300mm distance to become useful, I would guess. Perfect for larger industrial, electrical, HVAC, solar inspections and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you can even make out individual components on a circuit board if they are spread out a bit. But if you're getting closer to get any kind of detail, not a chance. Let's try the same thing with my macro dust cover. Ah, suddenly component pins and even traces become visible. Much more useful for microelectronics. I think you could get the same result by overpowering a drop of glue and rotating the lens on the camera module itself. But I don't know, this feels a lot nicer and these lenses cost only 20 bucks or so. This board demonstrates very nicely how far the thermal auras of an ovenized Zener diode, of its oven driver power transistor and an innocently looking chopper op amp spread out. And I'm afraid that isn't something I should have ignored in the construction of my LTZ Mu miniature voltage standard, where everything is crammed into the volume of a matchbox. The sensitive configuration and scaling resistors in there are not really temperature controlled by the Mu metal can heater, but are also subject to the whims of other warm components inside. Also problematic are of course the thermal gradients, about which we've talked at great length before. Long story short, that thing gets another revision, but I'm afraid it won't fit inside that cute mu metal can anymore. Of course, the thing with the thermal auras applies not only to small electronic components. Larger devices can produce lots of heat too, and that must not be allowed to influence anybody else. The Fluke Calibrator with its 30 degree C exhaust inside of a 23 degree C room is my worst offender so far. Nothing that matters can sit on its hot side. But 3458A multimeters also have some thermal eccentricities that have to be respected when planning a test setup. Here we already see something very interesting to investigate in the next video. Here's my new neighbor who has decided to build a nice new house directly in front of my window and to taunt me with that beautiful solar roof on a daily basis. Well, little does he know that he has hotspots that can degrade the efficiency of an entire string. <laughs> Here's some footage from summer where the dogs had reached a critical internal temperature and needed a refresher. So we went swimming in a local river. Uh oh, looks like somebody forgot most of their body in the water. Now there's only a floating head left. So in conclusion, this is of course a much better thermal cam for day-to-day -day business. It offers the same resolution as a Fleur E8, but for a fraction of the price. And with a small modification, one can unlock immense potential with Joe C's T-Vision computer software. At the moment Banggood is no longer selling that model, but there are alternatives with the same sensor. I'll put links to two examples in the description below. First this handheld model, which I'm 98.6% sure that it is identical internally. And second this smartphone plug-in module, which is at the moment almost another $100 cheaper. 
and it doesn't need any hardware modification to work with a computer software, just a USB-C adapter. And that's all for today. Thank you for watching.